Hi, welcome to Office Hours. My name is Patrick Curran, and along with my friend and colleague Dan Bauer, we make up Curran Bauer Analytics. Today, I'd like to spend a few minutes exploring a question that Dan and I often get in our teaching and our workshops, and that is, what is growth curve modeling? On the surface, it seems like a simple enough question, but it actually gets a bit trickier when you start to delve into it. Part of the problem is there are a lot of terms that are used to refer to the same set of underlying techniques. So you may have heard of growth curve modeling or trajectory analysis or latent curve modeling or latent trajectory analysis. All of these are different terms that tend to refer to the same underlying set of analytic approaches. And that's what I'd like to talk briefly about today. To begin, it's helpful to think about traditional methods of analyzing repeated measures data. So for more than a century, there have been two main lines of approach for analyzing typically two time point data, but it can be expanded to more than two time points. The first is raw change score analysis. And in raw change score, say that you have a pre and a post test design, you take the post test, you subtract the pre test for each individual, and the difference between the post and the pre becomes the unit of analysis. If you have two time points, you can estimate this using a t-test. If you have more than two time points, you take the difference between one and two, two and three, three and four. You can model this through a repeated measures ANOVA or repeated measures MANOVA framework. So there's an entire line of models that allow for the analysis of raw change. In contrast, there's what is called residualized change. And here, instead of taking the difference between the two time points, we regress the later time point on the earlier time point, and then the residual of that equation becomes the unit of analysis. So we would do this, say, in a regression model. We would use our pretest as a predictor, the post-test as a criterion or outcome variable. We'd regress the post-test on the pretest. And then what's left over, that is the residual, becomes the unit of analysis. And we might bring in other predictors or try to understand that in some other way. Those models too can be expanded to more than two time points. And you often see these as an autoregressive or an autoregressive cross-lagged design that's, that can be done in regression or through path analysis using structural equation model. The key to understand in these more traditional methods is they tend to be focused on a series of two time point comparisons. So if you only have two time points, it's comparing pre and post test. If you have more than two time points, it tends to break it down into what occurred between one and two, two and three, three and four, and so on. Now, we're gonna compare that to a growth curve model that takes a different approach. It takes conceptually a different approach and analytically it takes a different approach. Whereas in the two time point comparison models, we tend to pool over individual within time point, right? So if you think about it, we can get a mean and a variance of the pretest, a mean and a variance of the post test. That's pooling over everyone in our sample. Then we get the covariance between the two and our models are fitted to those data usually. In contrast, the growth model is gonna flip that on its head is what we're gonna do conceptually, and in some cases analytically, is instead of looking over individuals within time point, we're gonna look over time points within a given individual. So let's use an example to think about this more closely. So Dan and I have uh, data and an example set up on the web page. We'll embed a link here with this video, but it examines a set of repeated measures on aggressive behavior in a sample of, of children. So there are 405 kids. So let's start and say that I'm the first kid. All right, I'll be the first kid in the sample. And we'll look at age. So we have six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. All right, so this is age on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have some measure of aggressive behavior. All right, so say that you're the researcher, you go into my house, I'm six years old, you sit down with my mom and you say, all right, let's think about little Patrick in the prior 90 days and please tell me how many times he endorsed or exhibited each of these aggressive behaviors. And so my mom fills it out and we get some measure that say here. 
All right, then we wait a year, you go back into the home, I'm now seven, you ask mom again, and maybe it's here, and then maybe here is eight, and here is nine, and here is 10. So we have five repeated measures. Now the more traditional methods are gonna look at those, those paired time adjacent uh, 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 comparisons. So we might have, so age six to seven, maybe there's not very much difference. Seven to eight, I've got this huge jump. 8 to 9, it actually goes down. 9 to 10 is a, another jump. And we try to stitch our understanding together, looking at these, these pairs of 6 to 7, 7 to 8, and so on. Now, here's a different way of thinking about it. And this is core to understanding what the growth model is. Is notice, even though there's jumping up and down, that there tends to be an increase over time. So we're going to teleport back to eighth grade when we learned about fitting a line. And let's say we, I don't know, I'm not terribly good artist, but we'll do this. All right. So let's say this represents the line of best fit. All right. Obviously, it's not exact because some repeated measures are above, some are below. But notice that it's a data reduction technique. We've smoothed over these time points and they can be summarized using just two pieces of information. We have some starting point, and let's just arbitrarily call that alpha to represent the intercept of that line. And then we have some rate of change. We'll just call that beta. Rise over run, it's just a linear slope. So what we have is a summary of my five repeated measures in a more parsimonious way, because there are only two pieces of information. Now, what's interesting about this is, remember, this is my intercept and my slope. This is a summary of my set of data. The term we sometimes encounter with this is called intra-individual change. That is, what is the change that's happening within me, intra-individual? Now, for as much as I'm interested in me, Rarely do we want to look at one case, right? In this data that we have on, online, there are 405 cases. So what we want to do is take this concept of intra-individual change, and we want to expand it to every case that we have. So now imagine that we do what, what uh, uh, we just did, except we fit a line for each individual observation in the sample. Okay, so some kids are going very fast, some are flat, some are lower, maybe we've got some kids, a few kids going down. All right, we have an entire set of these trajectories or growth curves. You can see where this is going, right? They're individual growth curves. Now, as scientists, what's the first thing we like to do? If we have two or more of anything, we want the average. So we have a whole set of starting points, a whole set of rates of change over time. We could estimate what is the mean of those. All right, so again, just using some arbitrary notation is we can say mu alpha, that's the mean of all the intercepts, and then there's some slope. We could say, all right, there's mu beta. In growth curve modeling, these are often referred to as fixed effects. The reason is, is they don't vary. There's a single mu alpha, a single mu beta. It's the mean of all the individuals in the sample. Now, if the first thing we'd like to do is add everything up and, and compute the mean, the second thing is to evaluate is there individual variability around the mean. So notice some kids are starting higher, right? If, if you're at age six and kind of entry into elementary school, some kids are starting higher, some kids are lower. All right, so there's individual variability around the intercepts, but there may also be individual variability in the slopes. Some kids are increasing more steeply, some kids are increasing less steeply, some kids may not be changing at all. This individual variability we're going to capture in the variance, the variance of the intercept and the variance of the slope. In growth curve modeling, we're going to refer to these as random effects. They're random because they catch they, they capture the individual variability and starting point and rate of change. And a very cool parameter that we can also estimate is the covariance between the intercept and the slope. So on average, does where you start relate to where you go over time? So we've got fixed effects, we have random effects. Now here's the second term that we often encounter in growth curve modeling, and that is inter-individual differences 
in intra-individual change. So remember, each trajectory captures within-person change. I have a trajectory, you have a trajectory, we have 400 trajectories. But there's between-child differences, inter-individual differences. Some kids are higher, some kids are lower. Well, the first thing we like to do is get a mean, second thing we like to do is get a variance. Then the third thing that all of us want to do is given individual variability, we'd like to know, can we bring predictors into the model to understand that? That is, what kind of child starts higher versus lower? What kind of child increases more or less steeply? These are sometimes called time invariant covariates. What that means is the numerical value that the variable obtains doesn't vary across time. So they're, they're stable characteristics of the child or the home or the school, or they're a construct that we only have one assessment of. And so we want to say, well, on average, are there differences between boys and girls on where they start and where they go over time? That would be an example of a predictor, a time invariant covariate. But the models become really interesting when we expand these to include what are called time varying covariates, right? These kids are going through elementary school. They're age six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're changing classrooms, they're changing peer groups. They may have a new brother or sister, there may be a new divorce, a parent may lose a job, get a job. They're all of these time dependent influences that are, are poking and prodding the kid as they traverse through time, we can build those in. Those are called time-varying covariates. Another interesting expansion is we could look at a set of developmental trajectories in aggressive behavior, and we could link that to simultaneous developmental trajectories in, say, reading ability. And we could look at behavior problems and school success and how those two constructs travel together over time. That's a multivariate growth curve model. We could split it on group and we could look at the characteristics of, of development and the trajectories as a function of gender or some kind of parental constellation or parental diagnosis, something like that. So there are a whole variety of ways that we could expand these models to test uh, uh, different kinds of hypotheses that, that we may be interested in. But coming full circle to the original question, what is growth curve modeling? Is an initial response is growth curve modeling is a set of analytic techniques that allows us to take the set of information that we did observe on a child, the repeated measures on aggressive behavior, and based on that, make an inference about the existence of something that we believe to exist, but we didn't directly observe, and that are these growth curves, right? We didn't observe these growth curves. We observed the individual uh, measures around them. That's why sometimes they're called latent growth curves. They're latent in the sense that we believe them to exist, but we didn't directly observe them. So that's what growth curve modeling is, is we're using the data that we have to estimate the existence of what we believe to underlie the behavior, but that we did not directly observe. Now, the next question is, well, how do you fit these kinds of models to your own data? And I'm going to save that topic for a later video because we could do this case by case using ordinary least squares, but we could also fit a whole set of these models within the multi-level framework or within the structural equation modeling framework. But I will talk about that in another setting. So I hope this has been of some use and thank you for your time.